Welcome back to the latest episode of The Black Table on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, and every week we take deeper dives into topics and subjects of particular um, importance to Black communities, global Black communities, in fact. And today, uh, there's no more appropriate way to label the conversation we're about to have today than a global conversation about Blackness, about modernity, about the birth of the modern world. And the brother that we have invited, who has graciously accepted our invitation to come to the Black table, is none other than Howard French. Professor French uh, has been a professor at Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism since 2008. Um, he began his teaching career at the University of Abidjan in Cote d'Ivoire in the early 1980s. And uh, many of you probably know his work as a journalist and a long career as a journalist writing about Africa for the Washington Post, Africa News, The Economist, other publications. Uh, I came in contact with him, his work, when he was writing for the New York Times. He was a foreign correspondent and senior writer. He's reported from all over the world, Central America, the Caribbean, Africa, West and Central Africa, China, Japan. Um, he's been twice nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Um, and of his several books uh, that certainly have impacted me and a number of folks who uh, a lot of students have had over the years, uh, Everything Under the Heavens, How the Past Helps Shape China's Push for Global Power, uh, Africa, China's Second Continent. It is his latest book, We Are Here Today. To discuss and this book this remarkable book born in blackness you know see it there africa africans and the making of the modern world 1471 to the second world war one man i don't know how he did it but we are going to find out together is literally reinterpreting the history of the modern world over the last half millennia so without any further ado we're going to invite to the black table our brother professor howard french welcome brother howard how are you man it's beautiful to be with you, Greg. That was a lovely introduction, too, by the way. Hey, man, that's the that, look. That's the absolute least we can do when you work this hard. Uh, you know, we have to honor that and elevate that. And so we're deeply grateful. Um, we're deeply grateful. We want to jump right into it. Um, this book, which with notes goes to 500 pages, and it is a beautiful book, beautifully written, um, beautifully crafted, and beautiful looking too. We talked about that a little bit before. I want to start at the end in the afterward. Uh, as you talk about your family, you talk about your roots, you talk about your wife's roots in West Africa, Ghana, you talk about your family roots in Virginia. But there's something you say here that's going to, I think, allow us to ask you the question of how you conceive this book and what you hope to do with this book. You end the very last uh, paragraph of the book. You say, as much as anything else, the story of my ancestors put me on the path to study the broader history of the Atlantic world contained within these covers ending the invisibility of Africa in the construction of what we all know and experience as the modern lies at the heart of that struggle. Tell us, brother, this thing captured your imagination. You spent years on it. What are you trying to accomplish with this book? Well, to begin with, the book starts in my childhood, if you wish. Um, you know, I grew up in Washington, D.C. for the first half of my youth. Um, but my ancestral roots on my mother's side of the family are in Virginia, in central Virginia. And, and the story as we know it dates to the period of Thomas Jefferson, where a political ally of Jefferson, later the governor of Virginia, a man named James Barber, fathered a child with a woman he owned. And that woman is my ancestor, uh, my grandmother's grandmother. Uh, and I tell her story in this book. Um, we have the bill of sale for that person. We have a photograph. You, know that. you write about that. You said, no, this is not speculation. Huh? <laughs> That's right. We retrieved it from a Virginia courthouse. We have a photograph of the daughter that she gave birth to as a result of that coupling uh, with her master. Um, and so this has been part of my family's education and or my family education and conversation since childhood. We spent summers as I was growing up on that land, uh, leaving the city uh, to come to the Virginia heartland and, and, and return to our roots in that sense. And then, you know, you mentioned my wife, and this is the other big part of the story. I married a woman who is from, whose family is from Ghana, and specifically from a part of Ghana in the west of that country that has played an incredibly important but unrecognized role in the birth of modernity. Uh, unrecognized is too weak, cut out of the story of the birth of modernity. Uh, this is the place where Europeans first um, uh, succeeded in a decades-long search 
to connect with the wealth in gold that emanates from West Africa in the 15th century. They worked for decades to find where is all the gold coming from in Africa. And in 1471, a year that is mentioned in the title of my book, yes. they arrive at a place they come to call Elmina, which means the mine. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that's just a few miles from where my wife is from. And so really? in that sense, this has also been a family conversation for me from a very early age. Um, you know, and I've been married a long time now. And, and so I've been ruminating about all of these things. And I've also been, as you alluded to, in terms of my career, traveling a lot. I've been, I've worked all over the Atlantic basin. I've worked, I'm from the United States, of course, the American South in specific. I've worked in the Caribbean, Central America, Northern South America, meaning Colombia, Venezuela, et cetera, West and Central Africa. And I have never lived in Europe, but I speak European languages, several of them. And, and we all are steeped in European history, whether we like it or not. This is part of the standard way we are brought up, right? And so this was the stew out of which came this book, trying to make sense of where we, not just me, uh, be, there is a bit of biography here. It's a small piece. It's a small note or set of notes in the book, but where we all came from. And that means the white people too. All yes. of us yes. uh, came out of this cauldron whose base ingredient, whose in most important foundation was Africa and Africans. But you you, you start, it's fascinating, how, because of course, and, and, and as folks who get this book and read it, and hoping everybody listening to us will do that, of course, and share, you travel to great many of these places that you write about. And in many of the chapters, you open with your, your passage there. And when you said Europeans, I think, you know, we typically think of Europeans, Africans, Asians, those labels kind of become proxies for how we think we, we reduce dissimilarities between people. And as you talked about Ghana and your wife growing up right there, I think about the fact that, of course, Ghana has this robust trade, um, a, a robust um, tourism industry. And so many of us who want to connect with our roots, I mean, I've been to Ghana and, and I know, and maybe many of the tourists don't know when they get there, but learn, that Cape Coast and Elmina are two different enterprises. And what you do in this book beautifully, it seems to me, we'll talk more about this, of course, as we get deeper into the conversation, you you disaggregate Europe. I mean, uh, I think about Cedric Robinson in his book, Black Marxism, where he opens one of the chapters and says, for all intents and purposes in the 15th century, Portugal is a metaphor. And I'm like, that always stuck with me. But when you say Elmina, you know, when you when you go through, it's almost like a relay race. You talk. I mean, you have the the Portuguese, then you have the Dutch, and they get, and then the Portuguese get chased. And they going down, the, and then the English come in and take the thing from them, and they set up. Uh, is it Cape Coast as a kind of competing? They don't want to deal with the Elmina traffic. I mean, could you help us understand what we miss when we don't take the time to give a grant, give granular attention to these labels that we uh, often think about when we're thinking about world history, if we think about it at all. Sure. Let me let me try to um, go back to near the beginning of this story in answering okay. your question. Okay. And I'm going to pick up on the Cedric Robinson quote that you use. Um, so um, Portugal was literally nowhere in Europe in the 14th century. Portugal was a brand new kingdom. I'm, I mean, no offense to Portugal or to Portuguese people, but it was a brand new kingdom and a very poor place. There was nothing special or remarkable about Portugal. Portugal broke off from proto-Spain. Spain, as under that name, didn't exist yet. It was a bunch of kingdoms, the most powerful of which was Castile. Portugal breaks off, and, and Spain wants to recapture it. And Portugal is desperate for some kind of economic means to get onto its feet and be able to resist Spain. But because Portugal has no face onto the Mediterranean Sea, which is the typical, the traditional sort of um, highway of trade for Southern Europe, right, toward the east. Portugal says, we need to find another uh, source of commerce. And Portugal becomes obsessed in a way that is totally cut out of the story of the birth of modernity with Africa. The normal story we are told is that the Europeans were hell bent on finding a maritime route to Asia. And if Africa is mentioned at all, and it usually isn't, but whenever it does come up in these sort of standard accounts of the birth of the modern world, Africa is presented as a mere obstacle. It's inert. It's historically unimportant. Africa needs to be circumnavigated. In fact, 
the Portuguese, knowing about the story of Mansa Musa and of the incredible amount of wealth uh, known to exist in the heart of the Sahel region of West Africa, the Portuguese um, sort of fixate on the idea of connecting with West Africa as what I like to call their moonshot. This is their long odds bid to get onto their feet so that they can resist Spain and, and become strong. And so in the early 1400s, they set out down the coast of West Africa, they're not looking for Asia. They're looking for West Africa. Huh. And they have to overcome their superstitions and their technological uh, limitations. And by 1471, they arrive in the place they call Elmina. And lo and behold, even poor people in Elmina are wearing gold. And so they figure <laughs> out, oh, this is where the gold is, right? It is this discovery that sets everything in motion. Uh, <laughs> and, Oh, good. I'm sorry. Go I mean, it's been, go, no, go ahead. Go no, no. Ahead. I was going to ask is, I mean, the, the way you open the book, and I think about the Museum of African American History and Culture, which, mm -hmm. although Africa's history is obviously much older, when you go to that bottom floor, they have those parallel tracks where you see Europe and Africa at the same time. But you make a powerful point in the first part of the book, and we'll come back after the break and continue to talk about this, where you basically say Europe really doesn't have anything to trade. Any of those places up there, Asia is on the move. You make this whole com uh, connection between China. And it, there's a moment in time where you say if the Chinese had continued doing what they're doing, they're bringing giraffes back to China from, from East Africa. You know, Correct. But, but you talk about how they begin to venture out. You talk about Prince Henry. You talk about and you make a distinction between that. Is it the Aviz dynasty and the Ming dynasty? It's like the choices that become the choices we now attribute to Europe and this European mm -hmm. miracle are really, really informed by the places they can't go, the things they can't produce to trade with, and their obsession with getting things that they don't have anything of. When you say people are just wearing gold, I mean, and you bring Mansa Musa in very early, as symbolic of that. We, we, he's even on a map. In fact, there's a, mu a museum of African art has an ex ex exhibition right now with a reproduction mm -hmm. of the map, which of course you put on the cover of the book. I mean, That's right. do we have to rethink even what we think about in terms we think about this European genius? And I mean, as you're narrating this, just all that comes to mind. We absolutely do. So the Portuguese arrive in Elmina in 1471. Elmina is in the modern state of Ghana, right? Mm -hmm. They don't, they know there's an incredible amount of gold there, but the Portuguese don't have a rich material culture of their own. All they have to trade is cork, dried fish, and salt. Uh, and so the Ghanaians, as we shall call them in this conversation for simplicity's sake, say, sure, we'd be willing to trade with you, but the stuff you have is of no use to us. Huh. And so the Portuguese go back to Europe with some other goods that they had that they had acquired along in other parts of the West African coast, pepper and spices and things like that. And they establish for the first time trade circuits within Europe that are totally left out of the story of modernity. The Portuguese go trading these goods to Germany and to the low countries in order to get goods from those places in Europe that the Africans will be interested in. And then they come back the long sea voyage back to Elmina and they establish this trade in gold with Elmina. And wow. Elmina then, this, this commerce in gold uh, in which Christopher Columbus participated two decades before he ever sailed across the Atlantic. Man Vasco and boy, I sailed the Guinea coast as he wrote. That's and right. <laughs> That's right. Vasco da Gama, the man who discovered, as they say, the route to India, all of these famous voyagers, they are working for the Portuguese in this era to, to pilot ships in the trade with Ghana. <laughs> and this trade is so important that a number of very important, sort of historically speaking, central things begin to happen. Yeah. First of all, well, Portugal, well, poor well, and well, weak, gets 25, 30% of its crown revenue in that first decade solely from trade with Elmina. This is how Portugal is established as a secure and prosperous nation. It's it gold. starts in Ghana, in with Ghana. the gold in Ghana. Uh, Spain goes crazy with envy. Their whole project had been to reabsorb Portugal. They send a fleet to the coast of West Africa <laughs> to try to capture this trade and to defeat the Portuguese. The Portuguese had intelligence about this and therefore, even though they were far outnumbered, they ambushed the Spanish and and were able to, 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 to scare them off. And so the Portuguese then build this giant fort on the coast of West Africa, the very first European uh, fortified construction in anywhere in the tropics yes. in 1482. Yes. This is the slave trading center as it is known today that's near Cape Coast. 
In oh, fact, but, even but, as most Ghanaians don't know, this is not really about slavery at all yet. No, this is about a trade in gold. That's right. Um, well, let me, let one, me, let one, me one, 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 one last oh, thing. Oh, okay. Make that last point, and then we, we're going to come back after the break. I don't want to break okay. your momentum, though. Yes, no please. problem. So the Spanish, so the envy is such an important part of this story from yes. beginning to end, yes. meaning all the way to the Second World War. Yes. So the Spanish, crazy about the success of the Portuguese, say, we better start funding, void. we couldn't beat the Portuguese in West Africa. We better start funding voyages of exploration of our own. Christopher Columbus had already tried to get the Spanish to, to finance a bid to cross the Atlantic. They had laughed at him. Mm. Now knowing that the Portuguese had had such success in West Africa, the Spanish said, let's give some money to Columbus and see what he can come up with. If there's such so much gold in the tropics, let's let Columbus see if he can get some gold for us. This is the start of it all. It's what? not, let's sail to the Indies, let's sail to China, let's do this or that. It's all about the prosperity that stemmed from connecting with West Africa. Excellent. This is a good place. This is a good place for us, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. That really does lay the foundation. Uh, we are going to take a break. And when we come back, uh, we are going to continue with Howard French, his book, Born in Blackness. What we've just heard is uh, basically covers much of the first part of a five part book, uh, a book of nearly 500 pages which lays this out in great detail. So uh, back in a moment at the Black Table. Hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn lives. Angry pro Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. We're back, The Black Table. Uh, Greg Carr joined today by Professor uh, Howard W. French, uh, Columbia University, um, journalist, scholar, and we're talking about his latest book, Born in Blackness. When we left, Prof, you were leading us right to the lip of the the gold rush that opened up Europe, that created Europe in many ways. And, and, and around chapters five and six of part one, you talk about these accounts and and how they began to come out of Europe. And, and when you're talking about the the attitude toward black folk, you also you're very careful also to talk about the black folk who are who they encounter, these Portuguese. I mean, uh ultimately it'll be the Asantes and others, but you know, you also help us rethink what we know, and for most of us perhaps introduce what we didn't know about who those Africans are who encountered the Portuguese. Could you talk about that a little bit in terms of the folk who are there that the Portuguese encountered? Sure. So early in the 15th century, meaning in the 1420s and 30s, as the Portuguese begin this moonshot, as I've described it, desperate to discover a source of the source of gold in West Africa, hmm. they set sail down the coast of West Africa. They, they first arrive at uh, what is present day Mauritania, then Senegal, or then or, or further and further on and on, right? Mm -hmm. In the beginning, the Portuguese are not finding gold. This is what they're looking for. Uh, and because Portugal is such a weak kingdom, they need to figure out some financial means to sustain these efforts. This is all being done under the aegis mm 
of the man whose name you mentioned earlier, Henry the Navigator, who was the a, a crown prince of, of, of Portugal. So, so the, the first thing that they settle upon is to acquire human beings for sale into Europe. This is before the discovery of the new world, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so they start capturing through coastal raids small numbers initially small numbers of of sort of uh, uh isolated people who they kept who they surprised wandering along the near coast right um in ambushes uh, and they the portuguese discover in taking these people back to europe specifically to lisbon and to seville in spain they could sell human beings for a huge profit uh, and this is because Portugal and that part of Europe are just emerging from the Black Death, the period of the plague in which uh, more than a third of the population had died. And so manpower is in desperately short supply. And so they're capturing these poor uh, uh, individuals and they're focusing on areas of the coast that are not heavily defended. And that's because European technology was not, in fact, much superior, if at all superior, to hmm. West African technology. The one thing the West, the Europeans had that the West Africans did not have is tall masted sea vessels. Otherwise, the, 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 the military means of the Europeans and the West Africans was in rough parity. And so they're looking for, for places that are undefended where there are not strong kingdoms. Uh, to capture people. It, and, and eventually, I, I add to folks who are listening, you do make the point, however, that it wasn't that there wasn't an African capacity to even develop maritime technology. You do linger for a moment on the myth maybe some people have talked about, or perhaps myth, you say, well, we don't know, about the expeditions in Mali that they tried to do some ship, and they, perhaps they took gold and tried to get into the ocean, into the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, I believe firmly in that, that in the early 1300s, and so this is almost 200 years before Columbus, West Africans in the kingdom of Mali had a vision of the world being round and out of geopolitical strategy, they had a they conceived of a bid to cross the ocean huh. to discover what lands lay on the far side of what we call the Atlantic in order to establish a trade in their gold. Gold was they were the gold superpower. The superpower. And they were trying to try to cut out the middlemen of North Africa who were taking a big cut of their profit in trade in gold with Europe and say, let's discover some other lands. We figured out the world is round. Let's cross the ocean. They did not have tall masted ships, but they had sophisticated uh, understandings of the ocean and of its currents and things like that. Okay. I don't think we have any evidence that necessarily that they arrived in the Americas, sure. nor that they didn't arrive in the Americas, simply an unknown. But the, but the idea of this conception of theirs and of two bids, in fact, to try to cross the ocean yes. is pretty well established. We have very good reason to believe in this. That, that, that's interesting. The Guyanese scholar, as we, we both know, Ivan Van Sertema in his book, They Came Before Columbus, you know, kind of takes that conjecture and tries, tries to extend it. And of course, I guess it's kind of interesting because as you were talking before we came on, your your previous publisher, Random House, actually published that book, and the acquisitions editor was Toni Morrison, who you start her quote at the beginning. Of, it's just <laughs> there you go. But I didn't mean to interrupt you. In chapters nine and ten, man, that chapter, wealth and peoples and things, because all we often hear this: oh, black people sold black people into slavery. But you do an excellent job of helping us understand that if if you're West African, for example, I think you use the Akan, for example, then you go to Benin. If you've got a lot of land, but you need people to work the land, the wealth is actually in people and not things. And so there's this thing that begins to emerge and you really explore it in later sections where this class dimension gets comes into play. Where Africans, once the Portuguese have gone beyond the people they're randomly capturing and start negotiating and then trading for centuries, this exchange in people, uh, do you think there was a common understanding of enslavement between these various different groups of Africans and uh, you, you, I went to another thing. You talk about John Thornton later in the book, and I'm reminded mm -hmm. of Walter Rodney in the history of the Upper Guinea Coast, where he says, "Y'all can't say that slavery here was like slavery other places." But, and drawn from Thornton, and as you as you kind of tease out, you know, it probably depends on what type of African society you're dealing with. You can't just put a blanket over Africa and say all these societies were the same. I mean, could you help us understand even the, the question of wealth in people as opposed to wealth in things and how this plays out? These are such vital questions. Uh, first of all, linking to your previous question, the Portuguese quickly discover that these coastal raids that they're doing is costly to them. They're not strong mm -hmm. enough to impose themselves uniformly along the West African coast. 
And every time they raid someplace, they're losing men, right? And so the Portuguese finally, as they venture further and further, discover that there are really well-organized societies here and there along the coast, and that a smarter strategy for them is to negotiate trade. This is before they had discovered gold at Almina. And so let's negotiate trade with the Africans in human beings. The Portuguese figure out there's a lively interest in buying human beings, let's call them slaves, uh, into Europe. In fact, eventually 10% of the population of Lisbon and of Seville in Spain become African as a result of this trade. The question is often asked to me much as you did, well, so doesn't this mean that Africans are equally culpable for the slave trade or that mm -hmm. white people have nothing to be ashamed of or that this was nothing unusual or why are you laying a guilt trip on us about this thing? You know, um, there, there's this, all this peremptory uh, questioning about the basis of the slave trade. Mm -hmm. Africans, a few things need to be said. First of all, before the ex establishment of truly extensive links between Europe and Africa, Africans didn't think of themselves as African. That, it's a hard thing for us to wrap our minds around, right? <laughs> if everybody is black that you will ever encounter in your life, blackness is not a feature. That's blackness right. is just blackness. That's just you, one you human being. Point. You make that point with the, the ruler of Dahomey. It's like, look, all these people look the same. All we're doing is right. defending ourselves. I mean, it's fascinating right. to when you bring yeah. that point up, man. Well, I'm right. sorry. So, so, so blackness like whiteness emerges from this clash of cultures and these and these encounters over time. Hmm. Second thing that needs to be said is, you know, the, um, uh, worth in people as opposed to in money, right? This basis of African trade. So the Africans, even hundreds of years after the first sale of slaves by Africans to Europeans, Africans have no conception of what European, what use Europeans are making of enslaved people. Wow. Because Africans themselves do not use enslaved people that way. Africans throughout Africa worked to assimilate captured people, people who had been defeated in warfare and uh, into their own, into the victorious society, because the supreme value of any ruler was increasing the population. And so keeping them marginalized or as a subject class or something like that or or rank exploitation made no sense in that cultural context <laughs> and so the africans selling people to the europeans not only have no conception of chattel slavery and of plantations and i want to i want to deconstruct this word plantations plantations we need to get away from using this term plantations are prison industrial labor camps they oh, are nothing yeah. less than that right oh, plantation yeah is too, far too elegant for what yes, we're talking sir. about. Yes, sir. In Africans fact, have, let, me, let, me, let me pause you there for a second. We took a, mm -hmm. we just took a, this is going to be a shorter segment. We're going to take a quick break. When we come sure. back on the other side, please continue in that, with, with the point you're about to make. And we'll be right back at the Black Table. Um, Red Car, Howard French, born in blackness. Back in a moment. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to the Black Table. I'm Greg Carr here on the Black Star Network, and we are in the middle of one of, if not the most important conversation Black folk need to have when it comes to historical memory, the birth of modernity in Africa's place with Professor Howard French. Uh, Prof, when we left, you were just uh, leading up to the creation of these prison industrial death camps, these labor camps, these plantations. And, uh, and again, you all have to get this book. It's almost 500 pages. How do African people get pulled into this huge complex? And, and I'm thinking now about near the end of part two, we talk about the end of the world and pathways and becoming Creole. You you make this this point on brassage and creolization and how blacks become, I think the, the, the phrase you use is the uh, 
the unabsorbed catalyst <laughs> of this. I mean, could you talk? I mean, we're at, are we at the moment now where this thing just begins to explode exponentially in terms of these European countries that are going to use Africa as a piggyback ride into modernity or? Sure. So as, as, as Europe begins to subtract people from Africa and to put them to work in these new institutions that they established in the new world, which I'm calling prison industrial labor camps, Europe begins to obtain wealth on a scale that's never been seen before in human history. This is the most, I argue, the most important economic advance uh, in the modern age prior to the Industrial Revolution. This, this industrial labor camp model produces far more wealth than the Spanish acquired. So the most famous stories we have of what European wealth acquisition in the early modern age is the Spanish conquistadors going here and there in South America and Mexico and defeating vast empires and then carting off huge amounts of gold and silver in their galleons, right? Mm -hmm. we, we are not told how much more wealth, in fact, Europeans obtained in this era from prison industrial labor camps, growing especially sugar. First in Sao Tome, where this model is invented, Sao Tome just off of equatorial Africa. Then it transits in early 1500s, the Atlantic, and is established in Brazil. And then in 1630, it sets up shop in Barbados under the English, and then into the French Caribbean, Martinique and Guadeloupe, and finally um, Haiti, which is the richest, uh, it's not called Haiti yet, it's called Saint-Domingue, but French controlled and the richest colony in the history of the world. This is a cycle. In each of these places, each of these individual places, take Barbados, one third the size of the city of Los Angeles, the, uh, the, the exploitation of hundreds of thousands of Africans creates far more worth in that tiny little place than all of the gold and silver that the Spanish carted off. Right? Can I ask so you you're asking, yes. No, I was going to ask you, in, in, in part three, you've got a chapter, I think it's chapter 20, Capitalism's, Capitalism's Big Jolt. And I don't think people understand the impact of sugar and then the triggering of caffeine and then cocoa. I mean, you know, I often tell students this is almost like the international drug trade starts with Europe. But this but when you talk about Barbados and we will have to have you back, because in terms of contemporary politics, I would love to, to mm -hmm. hear what you think about somebody like Mia Moore, um, Motley and Barbados breaking away from the crown. Barbados, that little place. You know, because it's pro they have this proxy war. So could you talk a little bit about how these commodities literally created the political economy of these European nation states? Sure. So Barbados is, in fact, the beginning of the British Empire. Britain was a bit player in the story prior to the Barbados. Sugar is an extraordinarily rare and lucrative luxury item. And so the English had watched the Portuguese make an incredible fortune in Brazil. And they said, we got to do this too. And they capture Barbados, which has what had the Spanish controlled most of the Caribbean, but they had focused on the big islands, Cuba, Hispaniola, and, and Jamaica, which they originally controlled. And so the English said, okay, these smaller islands close to South America, the lesser Antilles, we can take over these and start this model. This is where England's wealth and preeminence in the world begins. This is the very foundation. It's in that tiny place of Barbados. And it begins with sugar and the extraordinary profits that are made from sugar. And it's not just an economic story of incredible wealth extracted from African labor in a little tiny postage stamp sized place like Barbados, but it changes English society in fundamental ways that your question alludes to. Hmm. So um, sugar and coffee become commercially available for the first time. In, in 1650, a coffee shop is opened in the city of Oxford in England. Right away, it spreads to London. Uh, English people become addicted to sweet coffee. Some entrepreneur gets the idea that if you have a captive audience sitting in a what we'll now call a cafe or a coffee shop drinking yes, a sir. stimulant, they like to discuss the affairs of the moment, the affairs of the day. Let's sell them a broadsheet with the news. This is the birth of newspaper. Come on, and man. It is out it is the, out of the birth of newspapers, which is derived from all of this extracted African labor, that English democracy takes its seat. Citizens begin to feel for the first time, we have a right to know what's happening in our country. This is a citizen's right. Uh, and we are going to be part of the debate. All of this flows from expropriated labor. 
so so the intellectual class the leisure class even the people working in the factories who can now work longer and produce the wool because they got caloric intake as a result of sugar Correct. while all that's going on you make a fascinating point about the the technology and the intellectual work behind extracting labor that is worked out in Barbados and then comes to Jamaica and the French are doing it and and I'm and as I was reading and I'm thinking you really have laid the foundation for how we should even reimagine how we think about labor in a modern capitalist society. They're working the hell out of these people and ultimately dehumanizing labor becomes a foundation in modern capitalism. But that stuff's worked out in the plantations too. Well, the, 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 the like you said, the prison industrial camps as well, isn't it? Yes, and that's why I insist on that term because this is a, a new form of labor organization. First of all, chattel is new. In other words, the reduction of human beings on the basis of race to the state of bestiality, that's new. Uh, and then secondly, the, the division of labor, the tight, nearly militarized supervision of workers, the extraction of productivity through pun corporal punishment, the uh, specialization of, of, of Africans who are, are, are broken down into teams and held accountable for their production and punished if they fall short in their productivity and trained in specialized tasks, all of these things which we think of, most of which we think of as part yeah. of industrialization, yeah. all take place in these prison industrial labor camps. And so, so we typically, no, we typically think, in, that's what we no, learned. We typically, <laughs> right. We <laughs> think industrialization starts in England yes. with textile factories. Yes. And this is a matter of ingenuity, right? This is, yes. this is Europeans. They come up with a bright idea. Aren't they clever, right? This actually happens in the skin of Black people. Um, uh, 150 years before there's anything happening with textiles in England. So can, let me ask you, let me ask you, man, this is fascinating. The English, as you say, they're not even players in this. Now, now I remember as a child, forget the, forget the ambush the Portuguese have on the Spanish. The only thing we learned about the Spanish, if we learned anything, was the Spanish Armada and their defeat by the English, because England is narrating this thing as their great breakout. But you make a point, you, you sustain an argument that the Dutch, actually, the Netherlands had the plan for this global thing. They couldn't bring it off. And it's almost like the, the English pick up their notes and execute the plan that the Dutch had. How did the Dutch plan this? Well, so the Dutch are a, have always been a small maritime nation, no natural resources, fragile land subject to flooding. And so they've always been outward looking, right? And the Dutch were um, in the uh, early modern era, they were the subjects of the Spanish. And the Spanish were, were Catholic, of course, the Dutch were predominantly Protestant, and the Spanish were taxing the Dutch heavily. And so this is kind of the American story well before America was born, right? Taxation with no representation, there's a religious dimension. The Dutch got fed up and said, we're gonna do our own thing. We're gonna break away from you. But because the Dutch were such important elements in the Spanish con um, commercial world, the Spanish fought back and tried to retain them. And so the Spanish, knowing how much money, I'm sorry, the Dutch, knowing how much money the Spanish were deriving from Portugal, because in 1580, Spain and Portugal merged, the Dutch didn't attack Spain, they attacked Portugal. And they went to Brazil and they, they stripped off Portugal's sugar colonies in Brazil. They knew this was the secret of Spanish wealth. And so, the Dutch then say, okay, let's run with this. We've got Bahia, we've got Pernambuco. Let's establish some colonies in North America, namely in New York, because this, these uh, places in wherever sugar grows, the land is so valuable from the productivity of enslaved people. It doesn't make sense to farm anything else. It doesn't make sense to produce anything else. And so New York is made as a supply colony for, for, for the rest of the Dutch sugar world, right? Um, and, and that's so why they have the, New Amsterdam before New York. Yes, before, that's just, New Amsterdam, right? Uh, so the Dutch have this integrated idea of what empire should look like. And this is what the English, the English see the Dutch success and say, we can beat the Dutch. We're bigger than them. We're also a maritime player. Let's build up our, 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 our naval power and we'll take them on and just steal their model. And so that's exactly what the, the English do. It's amazing. And of course, when, as you talked about, as you talk about in the book, I mean, Jamaica becomes their they're Haiti of sorts. And I, I laughed out loud, man, and reading that chapter, A Few Acres of Snow, where Voltaire, if Voltaire says, look, man, Canada, man, you can't grow nothing up there. <laughs> Just a few acres of snow. But we're, we're going to pause here and uh, we have one more segment. We do not have enough time. I hope you all understand how much 
everyone needs to read Born in Blackness, particularly Black people. And when we come back from the break, um, how we really want to explore who needs to read this book, why they need to read this book. And uh, as we're listening to you, you also narrate the story of Black resistance, which is so remarkable. So when we come back after the break, uh, we're going to continue our conversation with Howard French, Born in Blackness. The Black Table, Black Star Network, back in a moment. Folks, Black Star Network is here. A real um, revolutionary right now. Like, Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. I thank you for being the voice of Black America, Rollins. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back to The Black Table. I'm Greg Carr, Black Star Network. We're joined today by Professor Howard W. French. We are discussing his latest book, a remarkable book entitled Born in Blackness. Prof, uh, this, I, I'm so sorry in advance. We, we really don't have enough time, man, because we haven't even gotten to uh, the fourth and fifth, fifth sections. So I want to ask you, I'm sure a lot of people, particularly Black folk, are thinking, well, did we fight back? Did we just take an L? <laughs> and I'm thinking about even in contemporary ways, as you discuss uh, the way that these African societies develop, you talk about the toll that this type of thing had on the continent of Africa, how it disrupted African societies, created mistrust and fear that echoes to this day, created the population. But you also talk about resistance on both sides of the Atlantic. Could you could you speak a little bit about how that resistance looks, including those chapters in the last section where you really get into Louisiana, Mississippi, uh, you really see this widespread resistance? Um, thank you for that question, uh, Greg. Let me just start by sort of saying who I wrote the book for, right? Yeah, the, who I wrote the book for is in part a story of resistance. I wrote the book for everyone. We are all, whether we're black, white, red, yellow, or whatever, the 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 inheritors of modernity, the modernity that was created in this cauldron, this cauldron whose fire was, consisted of Africans and Africanness and of the labor extracted from Africans. And we need to place this back into the center of our history, right? But I wrote this book in specific uh, with the desire to persuade African Americans of the urgency of reconnecting across borders with the bigger, broader history of Blackness and to understand that resistance for us as a community consists not only of fighting our national battles and, and existing um, parochially, we got our hands full in this country, but we have to overcome the idea of resisting in a parochial sense, meaning, you know, just fighting local battles. That resistance consists of connecting across frontiers and reestablishing the urgency of what unites us via this history across regions uh, throughout the Atlantic, as opposed to the particularities that make one community special or distant or different or distinct from another. Like I'm West African or I'm African American and you're Caribbean and therefore we're not really the same thing. Resistance consists in part of getting rid of that kind of thinking. Okay, yeah. now back to your, your question explicitly. Yes. Resistance is part of the, is, is begins at the beginning of this story. <laughs> you know, so in Sao Tome where the slave and the prison industrial labor complex is invented, in the early 1500s, there are uprisings. Uh, there was a ship mutiny uh, 
in some of the first ships brought from mainland Africa to that island by the Portuguese, ships rose up, I'm sorry, slaves, enslaved people rose up and killed the Portuguese crew. They didn't know how to sail the boat, but they were close enough to the shore that enough of them survived to swim ashore and establish a community in the forest in the southern part of that island, which thrived for almost a hundred years before the Portuguese learned of them. And they connected with the enslaved populations on the island and nearly overthrew the Portuguese. So, so this it, is from the very beginning of enslavement. You mean and to tell me that, all, sorry? You, know, you mean to tell me that even when we do learn about the Maroons, or, and as you write about the Maroons in, in English speaking, uh, the Maronage, or as you talk about in, in the Quilombos in Brazil, you mean tell me that those first communities were not in the West Atlantic, but literally off the coast of Africa? Just off the shore of Africa. Africans at every moment of enslavement resisted enslavement. Wow. And, so, and they still tell those stories. Uh, when, you, when, when I read the chapter, you said they still tell those stories there. That's right. I drove up. No, no tourists go to Sao Tome. Right. So I show up in Sao Tome and I'm driving to the part of the island where those communities were established hundreds of years ago. And the school kids who surrounded my car knew right away why I had come. I didn't have to start asking them the question. They knew what their history was my and God. said, OK, you want to learn about this. Right. Sit down with us. We'll tell you. That's and so this is a story that continues all the way into the 19th century and the Civil War. You know, we're told the Civil War. Most of us are taught the Civil War militarily speaking, as largely as the affair of white people, right? There were the white armies of the South and the white armies of the North. That's and right. eventually, because the North had, had a more sophisticated and more industrialized economy, the North wins the war. In fact, the North won the war because Abraham Lincoln was finally convinced to allow African Americans to fight in the war. They had been clamoring to do so. They enter the war in the late stages. And this, this, this becomes a decisive moment in the history of that military contest. Mm -hmm. And we're not taught that, right? And so this is another form of resistance. Resistance is there from the very beginning to the very end. And, and you, I mean, I love it. And of course, everybody, you just have to read this book because we've left everybody. I mean, I mean, when, when you when you quote Desalines and you talk about Toussaint and if, if Napoleon hadn't sold them out, maybe they could have worked some out. I mean, you just go through and then Charles Desmonds and you talk about all these rebellions and then you end. And I couldn't help but think of of August Wilson when you quoted Mary Baraka near the end, when you're talking about the gift of black folk. I mean, Wilson's three of his B's, right? Baraka, the blues, Ramari Bearden, the gift of black folk. And then you evoke Du Bois. And by the way, you all, he's got everybody in there. CLR James, Eric Williams. We've left so much to the side. Maybe, Prof, as we kind of wind to a close, you can help us understand not only the gift of black people, but the responsibility of everybody in the world to recognize indifference. There isn't something to exploit, as we see what Europe does, but perhaps something to celebrate and learn from. I mean, but those, those last few chapters, you really do hone in on you know, the implications of this history for our contemporary world, particularly for black people. Could you could you talk about that for a little while? Sure. The gift of black people, Greg, is threefold. First of all, black people created the West. I can see people shaking their heads, falling <laughs> out of their seats. What do you mean they created the West? There could have been no West without Africa and Africans. What do I mean by the West? I mean uh, this condominium that it existed economically and politically speaking between Western Europe, the Atlantic nations of Europe and the continental United States, what becomes the United States. It would never have happened without African Africans. Before the year 1820, four times as many people were brought across the Atlantic from Africa than from Europe. Those are the people who under conditions mostly of chattel slavery, did the hard work that made the West viable as a thing that made the American colonies viable as an economic venture. There would have been no West without this input, right? So first gift, the West. Mm -hmm. Second gift, modernity. It is out of this condominium of the West that the thing that we casually call modernity arises, that Europe and the Americas uh, take a, um, uh, a, begin to ascend and separate themselves from previous parts of the world world centers of economic wealth in the world, India and China and the Muslim world in, in the so-called Middle East and whatnot, right? This is where the wealth of the West derives from. Third thing, America. What is it that makes America, America? Hmm. Um, this is a complicated question, no but the most, the most 
predominant piece of the answer to this question is the African-American content, the African-American input. It is what makes American speech special. It is what makes American music special. It is what makes American literature special. It is what makes American just the simple way we walk. I don't care what your race is. We can <laughs> see this in your walk, right? And so this is what makes America a How unique is, thing. Don't want to interrupt you, but I just want to chime in for folks who understand that this brother has traveled the globe, reported from all over the world. So when you say that, you're not just talking about something you've researched. This is a thing you've seen. There's an American walk around the world. <laughs> you seen the And lived. Wow. Right. Of course. Yes. I mean, of course. Man, yeah. I can't. So anyway, I didn't mean to rip you. Please, please continue. Please continue. No. So the, to, just to, to, to recapitulate those things, these these are big things, right? Yeah. What is what is the gift of black folk? The gift of black folk is modernity, is the West, and it is the American genius. All of these things come out of this encounter and this black foundation. Right. And they and so so put it back where it belongs, right in the center of our conversation. And this and this man, this is we're right at it now. I mean, as these national borders seem to dissolve, at least some of them, and the world shrinks and we face common threats like global warming. I'm thinking about Prime Minister uh, Mia Moore, as I said, uh, at the U.N. Uh, talking about this. Uh, and as these things happen, what can we learn from your work? as it relates to African and African-American, African-Caribbean, African-Latin American relations. I think about Ron Walters, the political scientist, our good friend and brother, late Ron Walters, who talks about these relationships and how they have to be strengthened. You talk about the roots of Pan-Africanism in the resistance. I mean, what, right. you know, so, and even in West Africa, when you talk about Nzinga and trying to create some types of formations where she can bring people together and she's not alone, of course, in this, what, what are some of the lessons we can learn? From so this, been, this this thing you've called Pan-Africanism is a struggle that has waxed and waned across the ages. The first yeah. instance of it, in my view, is on Sao Tome with the revolt that I described, oh, wow. okay? Uh, where people straight from Africa, uh, meaning the swimmers off of that wrecked ship, combine with other enslaved people on plantations and plot to overthrow Portuguese rule. Those are people who speak different languages, brought from different parts of Africa, and they have identified their common fate of exploitation and said, we're not going to put up with this, right? Um, uh, what we need to learn is that as this thing has waxed and waned, we, we need to, we can't lose sight of the ball, right? So in the 1940s and 1950s and in, in early 1960s in this country, this is recent memory, historically speaking. We were in a moment in this country where um, political elites among the African-American population had Africa and the Caribbean in, at the forefront of their minds. These are people who, you know, Martin Luther King, Ralph Bunch, um, uh, I could go on and on with many other names, um, Horace Mann, um, yes. uh, just to mention Americans, right? Had connections in Africa that supported Nkrumah in terms of uh, Nkrumah's independence drive in the 1950s to become the first sub-Saharan African country to obtain independence from European colonialism. Nkrumah becomes independent. People of West African descent in Britain and, and people in the West Indies dis begin to describe themselves symbolically speaking to adopt the identity as we are all Ghanaians because mm. we partake in the joy of the triumph of the Ghanaian drive for independence and for self-sustenance, right? Yes. This is the kind of spirit that we need to we need to nourish among ourselves in order to assist each other across these divides and to take strength from each other's successes and to learn from each other's struggles and our failures and to to, to, to plot our way forward more successfully. This is the Pan-African thing that I have said has waxed and waned. And comparatively speaking, when you think about what happened in the 50s and 60s, we're at a relatively low moment right now. That's People's true. are pretty, pretty much inwardly turned. Absolutely. Uh, what, what, we, what, what many of our listeners in this, uh, in this particular conversation need to understand right now is, is this. It's, a, it's an important thing, right? 10% of the people of the people who are permanent residents or citizens of this country who identify as black were born in Africa. And that number is growing. That number is growing 
fast. Yes. Africa is yes. itself growing fast. Yes. Africa is 1.4 billion people today. By 2050, it's going to be over 2 billion people. By the end of this century, it will be between 3 and 5 billion people. And That's check, more than China numbers. and India combined. Okay, okay? Check my numbers, Prof. I was reading a, a recent book. Uh, it's called a Scramble for Europe. And the author was making the point that at this time, he's estimating about 40% of those people in Africa are under 15 years old. Is that is that sound right to you? It's correct. Yeah. That is. Yeah. There's, so a, there's a demographic. Only, what? There's a youth boom in Africa right now. <laughs> there's a youth boom and they're sitting on a billion four and growing and have all these cousins mm -hmm. in the diaspora who seem mm -hmm. determined to look inward instead of outward. I mean, we only have about a minute left. And I wanted to ask you even because, you know, everybody's talking about the 1619 project. And for me, it strikes as a little bit overly nationalistic. And you've got a whole section where you talk about these Africans that were with the Spanish and it came with the mm -hmm. Portuguese. I'm wondering, how do we break out of these narrow nationalisms that kind of sometimes constrain the kind of thing you're, you're talking about? So I think I, I have no criticism for the 1619 project. Yeah, I think it's important. And yes, I mean that sincerely. Absolutely. However, it is a national project. It is, a, it is a project that places American history at the center of its focus and doesn't uh, expend a terrific amount of energy looking beyond American borders. And that's legitimate for its own purposes. Sure. My project is very different. I'm saying, let's put African Americans back in world history. Let's think of the big picture here. Let's go deep into time and talk about where we come from and that there's strength and purpose in this and that, you know, the American story is fine and it's great and there's things to be proud of and there's things to, to, to you know, shed tears over, right? But it's a small part of a much bigger story, and that much bigger story has a lot to teach us. Professor Howard W. French, when you said that, man, you know who I thought of immediately was Carter G. Woodson, who said the same thing. He said, this isn't Negro history. It's the Negro in history. And you've That's given right. us, you know, you've given us with this book. The latest as I was reading and I was thinking about journalists like Lerone Bennett with Before the Mayflower, folk who are writing to general audiences like um, There's a River, Vincent Harding, mm -hmm. and those who have written many academic books and textbooks, which make many of these points. But you, not only as a scholar, but as a journalist, crafted a way to bring all those stories together, add your perspective and put it in a place where. And as I told you in, in other uh, other contexts, uh, some school children, there's their family, there's a family where they were reading this, the, the, the book to their children. And the child said, I want to ask Professor French a question. <laughs> so, I mean, that's the reader. That's the reader accessibility to this book. And we want to thank you for this work, brother. It's a real gift. And we intend to honor you by reading it and thinking and acting on what you laid out for us. So thank you. I, for I'm honored. Me. I'm I'm honored by your spirit, Brother Carr, and, oh, and by the intelligence of your questions and by the, the just the sort of the deep and open kind of commitment that you have to these topics. And, and I welcome the, the audience. Don't be intimidated by 500 pages. I've written it for you. It reads from start to finish. Well, probably we're people of the book, as you say, the point that they made when they deal with the Muslims. This is a book. I mean, the Bible is a lot longer than this. And so if you can carry the Bible, you certainly get born in black. So there thank you, you Professor French. Howard French, for joining us here at the Black Table. And we're looking very much forward to having you back soon so we can continue the conversation. It'll be my pleasure. That's it. That's it. Back in a moment. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. 
We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, wait to $100,000. We're behind $100,000, so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zell is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. table red car black star network we have been joined for the hour by professor howard w french discussing his book born in blackness and so we'll end today with a quote from one of professor french's friends and comrades and colleagues a man who is now an ancestor the great haitian uh, scholar word warrior culture keeper michelle rolf trulio trulio wrote that history involves people in three distinct capacities Number one, as occupants of structural positions or agents. Number two, as actors in constant interface with a context. And number three, as subjects, that is, as voices aware of their locality. Peoples are the subjects of history the way workers are the subject of a strike. They define the very terms under which the situation can be described. Without knowing who we are in time and space, we often become people who are acted upon instead of people who act. And today we spent the hour with a brother who is urging us through his scholarship, through his practice, through his model, that as we become informed, we act to create the world we want to live in. So join us again next week for the next uh, convening of the Black Table. Looking forward to that. And in the meantime, y'all stay safe.